and Happy New Year to you all. Uh, so good to be here with you today. And uh, lately, I have been living under Murphy's Law. And it just seems like one thing after another. I, If you were with us on New Year's Eve, we had a wonderful night together. Uh, I pinched a nerve in my hip again, and this time it's more painful to sit than to stand, so I'm standing. So as a bonus, New Year's Eve, I lost my voice too, so uh, we'll be uh, working our way through that this morning. We actually recorded first service so we could just air it for second and third, but God's given me enough strength uh, to get through, so thankful for that. I might be a little uh, gravelly and crackly, but we're going to make it. And then just to, you know, top things off this morning, I'm driving on the freeway to church. I'm thinking, man, is it quiet this morning. It is just, what an interesting uh, start to the new year. It's so quiet. And then it dawned on me, I forgot to put my hearing aids in, so I can't hear you guys. So you're going to have to shout louder this morning so we can be in on this together. So, well, listen, first of all, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, and if you have not heard our word for the year, it's been described as what the world needs now. And it's also been described as what there is much too little of. And our word that I have openly confessed that I resisted and waited for another is right on front of the podium, and it is love. Now, as I have been saying, I wanted something more aggressive. I was hoping the Lord would give us like a line from Tombstone, you know, like, I'm your Huckleberry, something like that. But, um, you know, I battled this and battled this and battled this. I just didn't, I didn't want this for our word, to be very honest about it. And in the 22 years that we have been getting words from the Lord for the very first time, I asked her first, and I said to Terry, can, you, can I tell you what the word is and tell me what you think? I would just so resistant to it, I think, because of all the stuff we're going through and uh, as a country and as the church. And I told her what the word was, and she went through the roof. She was immediately excited, and her excitement got me excited. And then she started talking about it, and the next thing I'm thinking is, man, this is not a soft and mushy word. This word is an assault weapon. It's an assault weapon on the hate of the devil and how he's seeking to roam the earth and devour us, as we've talked about. So listen, we need to understand that love is an impenetrable force that Satan cannot breach. Why? Because we cannot be separated from the love of God. and He'd like to do nothing more. And the reality is we're going to learn this morning that love never fails. We're going to learn later in the year that perfect love casts out all fear. We're also going to learn that great love is a love that lays down its life for its friends. And I think we all know that loving God causes all things to work together for good. And listen, as that old song goes, love will keep us together. I think we're going to need to stick together now more than ever in these last and bizarre days in which we live. After all, one of these years has to be the year of the twinkling of an eye experience. And why not 2022? It's as good as a candidate as any. And the one thing we need to recognize before we launch in this morning is that we all know the word love. We know it's found all over the Bible. We know God is described as love. He's not loving. He is love in and of itself. But the word we're going to look at and focus on this year it's not a word that was found in ordinary Koine Greek. And Koine Greek just means everyday language. And so the Greeks wouldn't use this word. And it's almost as though it was held supernaturally to be used to describe a love that's of a different level, a love of a different kind. It's a supernatural kind of love. It's a love that's greater than human love. It's a love that elevates God's love above all other love. And it's also a love that is exclusive to the born-again believer, even though it's available to all of the world. Not all choose to experience this love. Now, we've all heard the word, and I'm sorry, I get a little pet peevy about some things. I'm going to pronounce it the way it's actually supposed to be pronounced, and you can pronounce it the way we've all heard it for years. 
and that's the word agape. The word is actually agape. So when I say agape, you say agape, and let's all just get along, okay? So, and the word actually means affection. It can mean goodwill. It's not what Jesus came, it's not what the angels announced. Goodwill on earth, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. And again, it can also mean benevolence. And hasn't God been benevolent to us? Hasn't he given us every good and perfect gift? Hasn't he given us all things pertaining to life and godliness? So again, this is something exclusive to God. Yet we also find the word love found in 1 John 2.15, where John the Beloved says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone, say anyone, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, we have two different Greek words translated as love here. The first is translated in John's Holy Spirit-inspired mandate is agapao, and it means love in the social or the moral sense. And the second word is our word, agape. So what John says is that we're not to fall in love in the social or moral sense with the things of the world. He goes as far as say, if we love the things and cares of the world, then the agape of God is not in us, and this is therefore proof. Now, the Bible also uses the word phileo, which is translated as love, which is the love of a friend, or we might even say brotherly love. We find it in Revelation 3 and elsewhere, but this is our example from Rev 319, where the Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. And again, this is the uh, brotherly kind of love. And the Lord, Lord is saying, you know what? Uh, you, you're my friends, but I'm still going to correct you. I'm still going to chasten you into a zealousness to repent. So what we've had thus far is we have agape, agapao, and phileo, all translated as love, yet all of them carrying different meanings. Well, this is important because we need to realize even though we have only one word in the English language, love, it has different meanings. Just case in point. If you say you love pizza and you love your wife and you mean exactly the same thing, you got a problem. We can say we love pizza, right? Or uh, one of somebody we know uh, delivered us some uh, tamales the other day. And I haven't had Christmas tamales in a while. And it was, uh, my wife went on and on and on and said, oh, when he gets these, man, he's going to be happy. I love tamales. And I love Terry. But I love Terry more than tamales. I love Terry differently than I love tamales. And so we have to understand that the love we have in view for 2022 is different than the term we use. It is something that is otherworldly. And therefore, not only do we have to begin in this chapter that's called the love chapter, we have to begin with this title, which is Love Is. Our title is Love Is, and we'll add to that as we go. Now, in this famed love chapter, Paul is going to use a string of 15 Greek verbs to define what love is, what love does, what love is not, and what love does not do. And all the occurrences in our verses are going to be the word agape. Now, in Matthew 5, 43 to 44, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I can't hear anything, so I feel like I'm here by myself. If I couldn't see you, I wouldn't even know you were here. <laughs> Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Now, again, this is important for us to understand because this is agapao. It is that neighborly kind of love. We have a different love for the body of Christ and for the King of kings and Lord of lords and the head of the church. And this underscores for us that the love God has for us and that we are to have for each other is something that is exclusive to the church. It's a perfect love. It's a supernatural love. And our text today is going to describe and define for us what love is as we begin another year that's bound to be a bizarre year where we're going to need to stand together and love one another like never before. So let's look at our word for 2022, find out what love is and is not, 
does and does not. We'll start with 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. Would you stand and read those with me, please? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. And Lord, we don't want our relationship or our earthly existence to be unprofitable or to count for nothing. So Lord, we pray this morning that even though we understand the word and the term and much of its meaning, Lord, much like the disciples ask you to teach them how to pray, I ask you to teach us how to love the way you want us to. Correct us where we're wrong, enlighten us where we need more information. And Lord, may this be the launch into a year where love is expressed through us, the body, like never before, to one another and even to our enemies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, there are those who believe that chapter 13 was actually a scribal insertion in between chapter 12 and 14 because they see it as being a rabbit trail on Paul's part in light of the content and context of chapters 12 and 14, which is introduced to us in chapter 12, verse 1, verse 1 as concerning spiritual gifts. That's the subject matter. And Paul says he doesn't want us to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. And you know, I was thinking about some of the things we're going to talk about today, and I think it's, it's worthy for us to start with a reminder that there is nothing uglier to the Lord than someone who is prideful about their earthly position among his people. There's nothing uglier to the Lord, which would include those who are prideful or condescending to others because of their own self-perceived spirituality. Listen, we're all trying to make our way through, and we've all received gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And he's distributed them as he wills, not of our worth, but as he wills. Therefore, none of us have anything to brag about. We don't have anything to boast about even regarding being saved. He saves us when we were yet sinners and he died for the ungodly. And to see oneself as more mature or worthy because of what God gave them and thus believing it made them superior to others is ridiculous because we got our gifts from God and we got them according to his will. Now, if you want to know how the Lord feels about such an attitude, just look at his exchanges with the Pharisees who saw themselves as the elite amongst the Jews and better than everybody else in a sense. And listen, this chapter is not an additive. This chapter is an anchor. It's where we anchor our attitudes and it's where we anchor our understanding and definition of love. And the reality is people have been fighting in the church and dividing over spiritual gifts since the church was born. Case in point, the letter to the church at Corinth. <laughs> Oddly enough, nowhere has the church been more divided and fought more over the least of the gifts, which is tongues. Our tongues for today? Come on. Are the gifts for today? Is tongues a gift? Well, then it's got to be for today. No. This is where Paul starts. He includes a full spectrum of the gifts from the least to the greatest as he mentions tongues, which is the least of the gifts, and he follows that by prophecy, which is the one gift we're told to desire. Now, prophecy in the New Testament is not like prophecy in the Old Testament where God would tell somebody what to tell the people, tell them about the future, tell them what to do, tell them when to go into battle, tell them not when, not, uh, when not to go into battle, the gift of prophecy in the New Testament age means to speak by divine inspiration. And listen, we've already been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. We don't need any new revelations. We don't, no one is going to find out something that the book of Revelation didn't tell us about the future. We have everything we need to know. So prophecy, according to the New Testament, is to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul starts here, and then he moves from the communication gifts, tongues, and prophecy, and he begins to mention the confirmation gifts, where he mentions mountain-moving faith. And then he goes on to the compassion gifts, 
the feeding of the poor, and then the confirmation gifts, the giving of your body to flames rather than denying the Lord. And he says, if these things are done without love, then your words are like a clanging cymbal. Your mountain moving faith means nothing and your compassion is completely unprofitable. And because of the heavy influence in the cults uh, of the cults in Corinth, the streets of the city were lined with noisy, clanging cymbals and gongs. And these were struck with the intention either to invoke the pagan deity or the false god, or to chase away demons, or simply to call pagan worshipers to the temple. Now, the thing about these gongs was they were neither capable of making a melody, nor were they capable of producing harmony. And usually a gong was just a flat piece of copper, and a cymbal was basically the same thing, and it wasn't struck with a mallet or hammer. They were just banged together, and they made a sound. They couldn't play a tune or make a distinct sound. They just had one thing. And some have offered that empty brass bases were also set on the corners of a stage where a Greek play was being put on, it was kind of a primitive form of am, uh, amplification that these empty Greek uh, uh, brass vases would vibrate and kind of move the sound off the stage out into the audience. And they themselves, however, were empty and lifeless. They had no life of their own, which fits well with Paul's description of the loveless practice of the gifts. And either way, whatever he's referring to, gongs and cymbals in the streets or brass vases on the stage of a Greek play is irrelevant, but the truth he, I believe, is making is significant to you and I to launch out in the year. And it's just this. Listen this morning. Love is the difference between religion and relationship. Love is the difference between religion and relationship. And we cannot overlook the fact that Paul is likening loveless Christian activities to the actions of cultic religious practices. And it reminds us that the love we're talking about is not the same kind of love that people in the world have. It's of a supernatural origin and likeness. It's different than natural familial or a friendship type of love. As a matter of fact, Jesus put it like this in Luke 6. He said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? That's worldly love. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend from those whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lead to, lend to sinners hoping to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be what? I don't know if you said anything. I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, here's the admonition again. Be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Now remember, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus is God. Amen. This is God speaking. And he's highlighting the fact that God's love is not equal to human love. And thus God's treatment of the unthankful and the evil is not reciprocal. In other words, he doesn't treat people the way they deserve. Somebody better say amen to that. He doesn't treat people in the way that they deserve, nor does he treat people based on the way they treat him. He came looking for us. Listen, you never found God. He found you because he draws people to himself. His eyes roam the earth, searching for those to show himself strong on behalf of. Now, this is not agapeo. This is not phileo. This is agape. This is loving like God does that we're called to. After all, God so loved a sin-filled and dying world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, religion, in contrast, is an activity that hopes to achieve or receive something as a result of efforts and practices. And Paul says, listen, speaking in tongues without love, having discernment and mountain-moving faith without love, and even giving to the poor or your body to be burned without love is nothing more than the clanging symbols of the pagans or the gongs of the cults. It accomplishes and practices or profits nothing to its practitioners, just like 
religion does for the soul of man. Religion can do nothing to save us. It requires blood to save us, and Jesus shed that blood. Amen? Now, in Luke eleven thirty-seven 37 to 44, Jesus was speaking, and a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Now, he's not saying that, you know, come on, what kind of hygiene has Jesus got going on here? Everybody knows you wash your hands before dinner. No, he was concerned that he didn't wash his hands in a ceremonial manner. He didn't use a pitcher to pour down over his fingertips and let it run down off his elbow, like the Pharisees prescribed that washing had to be done. And so the Lord said to him, now, you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean. But your inward part is full of greed and wickedness, foolish ones. Did not he who made the, make the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have. And indeed, all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe, men and rue, and all manner of herbs, and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees. And by the way, when Jesus says, whoa, something bad's coming. For you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you're like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. And as I said, Jesus' strongest language during his earthly ministry was pointed toward the religious. Those who saw themselves as elite, those filled with spiritual pride. Now, the Pharisees were nothing more than religious, for their actions and acts were loveless. They turned the Sabbath into something it was never meant to be, exalting Sabbath observations as they defined them as more important than even causing a lame man to walk, or a man with a withered hand to stretch it out and for it to be restored. They skipped over those things, as Jesus pointed out, and said all they cared about is that he did it on the Sabbath, that they had turned into something it was never meant to be. They looked religious because they were. They were religious and they were loveless, and Jesus referred to them not only as hypocrites, but even worse. He said in Matthew 23, 27 to 28, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which appear, uh, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. He's calling it a bunch of phonies. Even so, you also appear outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I think Paul, being a former Pharisee, seemed to understand and express Jesus' distaste for loveless religious practices, including those associated with the Christian faith. Because that's what Paul is dealing with in our chapter. He's not talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about hypocritical actions within the church, and he's trying to expose them and call them back to love. Now, having exposed uh, loveless actions as equal to that of pagan rituals, Paul now begins to define what love actually is and is not, does, and does not. So let's keep reading in verses 4 through 7. Paul says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, we mentioned pride earlier uh, being a factor in the church, spiritual pride especially, that Paul was dealing with because of this pause in the midst of a treatise on spiritual gifts. And that's made clear in that Paul mentions that love is not puffed up. Now, the Greek word translated as puffed up appears only six times in the New Testament. Five of them are in 1 Corinthians. So that tells us there's a pride problem, a puffy problem in the city of Corinth. And again, Paul is using this fact to reveal what love ought to look like. Instead of pride being present, and creeping into the church based on one's spiritual gifts, Paul is saying this has to stop. This isn't part of love that God has given us that we have experienced and are to express. You know, Paul, between 1 and 3 and 4 and 7, he also switched from the first person. He was using himself as an example initially, and now he personifies love 
as the direct object in the discussion of verses 4 through 8. He begins with the fact that love is patient. That's what suffers long means. How many wish patience was a spiritual gift instead of learned behavior? Yeah, it'd be nice if God just gave it to us, but uh, he has to teach it to us. Now, he pairs this with the attribute of being kind, because these two are rightly paired as they travel in that manner. When patience goes, kindness usually goes too, much of the time. And we might say Paul opens the definitions of love with love's attitude. Now, if you remember from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we're told that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering and kindness. There's patience and kindness paired together again. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In other words, if you live like this, you don't have to worry about the consequences of sin. There's no law against these things. These are the things that please God. Now, let's remind ourselves that uh, in contrast to the works plural of the flesh in Galatians 5, the fruit is singular. And that means that the works of the flesh may manifest, dif manifest differently from person to person, but the fruit singular of the Spirit is the same in all of us. We all get all of these things. When we were filled with the Holy Spirit, we got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, at least access to these things. We don't always walk in them, but we can. Now, he then moves to love's actions and inactions, beginning with what love does not do. He says, love does not envy. And again, the juxtaposition of this chapter between 12 and 14 tells us that spiritual gifts and calling are the primary source of the pride-based actions. Now, in other words, Paul is saying, you know what? Love doesn't covet what God is going through somebody else, especially not to the degree where that they boil over with envy. And Paul then seems to move to the other end of that same spectrum where he says, love certainly doesn't parade itself and uh, not because of anything that God is doing through any of them. And this then leads to being puffed up, which is the word for haughty. I have to say, in my own personal opinion, there are a few things uglier to me than a pastor who thinks he's the only one that's right. And anyone who disagrees with him is wrong and needs to be called a heretic. Now, we need to be confident in our interpretations of Scripture, because if you don't believe what you're teaching, you ought to just shut up and get another J-O-V, right? But the reality is, listen, I've been teaching the Bible for some years now, and I have changed my position on some things. And I have thought them to be one thing and found them out to be something different. And listen, everybody has different things that they look at through a different lens. And listen, for somebody to stand up and say, anybody that's not like me is wrong, that's of the world, that's not of the Lord. And of course, there are non-negotiables. And there's a fine line between being confident in your research and being haughty about your position. You see, love never takes the haughty attitude. And a haughty attitude is always accompanied by behaving rudely. And love is not self-promoting, nor is it provoked, meaning easily angered. And love does not rejoice in injustice. That's the meaning of iniquity. Now, while the context is related to what spiritual gifts were causing in the church at Corinth, the definitions of love are not limited to the church setting and the practice of the gifts. Because if you really run through carefully the things we're seeing here, what you're getting is a description of Jesus and how he loves and how he treated and did not treat people. And isn't he the one that we are to seek to imitate? Doesn't Christian in and of itself mean Christ-like? Aren't we supposed to live like him? Isn't he our model? I don't know if you're saying anything. I wish you'd shout or do something because it's awful lonely up here today. In Psalm 97.10, the psalmist says, You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. God is for us. Amen. Amen. And in Psalm 139, 23 to 24, the psalmist says this. He pleads with the Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting, meaning the way of God. And listen. Anybody, any pastor who says they've arrived and they've got it all figured out needs to say this instead. Search me, O oh God, and show me where I am wrong. See if there's any wicked way in me. See 
And, and listen, especially that haughtiness and rudeness thing, there's no place for that in the body of Christ. Amen? Now, as we transition from what love is to what love, from what love is not, rather, to what love is, we need to recognize that envy, haughtiness, pride, rudeness, self-seeking, short-temperedness are all works of the flesh. Those are all the works of the flesh, or some of them, I should say, but they're all, they share that common feature. And again, the love we have in view is a love that is of a supernatural origin. Therefore, it cannot be any of those things because those things are all flesh. And we can use this as a litmus test or a unit of measure of our own expressions of love toward one another. In that, if we find ourselves to be short-tempered, we need to tell ourselves that's of the flesh and not of the spirit. That's not an agape kind of reaction. If we find ourselves feeling haughty about something we did or God did through us in all actuality, you know, we need to check ourselves. As Brother Dave Roberts says, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And we need to make sure that we're not getting ourselves all puffed up over something that we had no responsibility for. And all we did was say yes to what God told us to do. So let's pause and make a point, and then we'll look at what love is. And this is something I think we need to get our heads around, especially this year. Listen. Love is something we do, not just something we feel. Love is something we do, not just something we feel. Now, we have to do things we don't feel like doing all the time, right? Yeah, everybody feels that on Monday morning. I don't feel like going to work today. Anybody feel that? Yeah, it happens all the time, but we have to go anyway, and most of the time people do. Now, we have to realize that because the love we're examining is supernatural, that means when we're struggling with patience, and we do, I know I do, we can still be kind. We can still be kind even though we might be frustrated with something or someone. And when God has gifted us spiritually, we can still be humble. We can let God use us and, and follow after him and study hard and do all the things we ought to be doing. I've had people talk to me about it many times over the years, and I've said the same thing to all of them. And uh, they ask about how many hours I study and all that. I said, you know what? I learned a long time ago. If I don't study, the congregation will be the third to know. Because you'll find out if I haven't been studying. And you'll find out on Sunday. you find out whenever I stand up here. I say you'll be the third to know because I'll know, God will know, and you'll find out. So we need to be diligent at these sayings. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not teaching a book I wrote. I'm teaching the book he wrote. And this is about what he has to say, not what I have to say or any other pastor has to say. And listen, we can teach the book and still be humble. And listen, when something happens that makes us angry, we don't have to get angry or return anger in kind. When somebody's rude to us, we don't have to be rude to them. And this is what Paul is saying. And even though we may feel like doing unto others as they have done unto us, agape doesn't do that. And that's the love that we have. And love decides not to... Um, through the power of the Holy Spirit, respond in the way that you have been treated. Love doesn't do, the agape doesn't do what the flesh feels. Agape does what the Spirit says. So what exactly does love do? Paul says, one, it doesn't make evil plans. And the fact that this follows being provoked, we might say love doesn't repay evil with evil. He also says love rejoices in the truth. He says it bears beliefs, hopes, and endures all things. Now, we need a little dissecting here to understand that better. And I think that could happen by simply reading it like this. Love bears through all things. Love believes through all things. Love hopes through all things. And love endures through all things. In other words, love, the agape love, is not influenced by external experiences. It's not influenced by the things going on around us, our own personal circumstances. And listen, we've had a lot of negative encounters in life lately. We've got a lot of crazy things going on. We've got a lot of crazy people in places of power. We've got a lot of weird stuff going on. But I think we also need to realize there are burdens that we're not supposed to bear. There are things that we're not supposed to believe. There are things that uh, we shouldn't place our hope in. But we are able to endure all things. In other words, we cannot let what's happening around us or to us influence us to move away from agape love. We have to stay in that supernatural love state. Now, 
including when we experience what Jesus said, which is building here in the United States in Mark 13, 13, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who what? endures to the end shall be saved. And listen, love is not shaken or moved off course by circumstances. It endures. It remains steadfast through all things. Now, let's look at 8 through 13 and we'll wrap this up before I totally run out of steam here. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that, just, that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Now, the word fails means to be driven off course. Love is never driven off course. We just made that point. But the word fails can also mean, and does so in this context, to drop off. Or it can be translated as to become inefficient. And what follows is further evidence that chapter 13 is not some scribal insertion at a later date, but it is in regards to the fleshly things creeping into the practice of the gifts in the church in Corinth. And Paul says, listen, love is never going to drop off. Agape is never going to become insufficient. But prophecies will. Tongues are going to cease. Words of knowledge are going to cease. And they will when that which is perfect has come, and there's no need for those things any longer. Now, this has been pretty much a hotbed of debate down through the centuries. And some say that which is perfect is the full canon of Scripture, the whole of the New Testament. And when the New Testament is completely written, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit anymore, basically, is the argument. Now, Paul actually interprets for us the meaning through his illustration. He says, now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is complete, that's the meaning of the word perfect, has come, the age of partial understanding is going to come to an end. Listen, we have the whole Bible, right? But do we know everything? No, we don't. We don't even know everything that heaven's going to be like. we got some pretty spectacular details, streets of gold, gates of a pearl, foundations of precious stones. We know all those things, we, but we don't know what all it's going to be like. So we still know in part. So it can't be the scripture that's in view here. But what is in view is Philippians 1.6, where Paul says, to be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until when? That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the day of Jesus Christ. That's when everything will be complete. That's when 1 John 3, 2 says, we will be like him when we see him. We'll see him as he is. There'll be no more partial understanding. Now, listen, if the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, as some argue, that's a big problem. And the reason I say that's a big problem is because that means nobody speaks by divine inspiration and every pastor is given speeches, not sermons. If the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. Now listen to this. If the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, as recorded in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, nobody has any spiritual discernment. Why? Because it's a gift of the Spirit. And you can't take a celibar approach to any portion of the Bible, including the gifts of the Spirit, and say, well, that's for today, that one's not. Where's that list? When that which is perfect has come, that's Jesus. When he's coming, we're with him. We're not going to need words of knowledge anymore. We're not going to need to speak in tongues anymore. We're going to know everything there is to know, because when we see him, we will be like him. Listen, let's add to this. If the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, nobody has any faith. And get this, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith is a gift of the Spirit. And if the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today, nobody is pleasing to God, and we're all going to hell. But we have faith. And God has given to each one a measure of faith. So we indeed can be pleasing to Him. 
and listen. We need words of wisdom today. We need people who speak by divine inspiration and God inspires them and tells them things that need to be said from the scripture and as well as words of encouragement and exhortation. That's what the gifts are there for the building up of the body of Christ. Now listen, Paul isn't saying when the Bible is complete, you won't need the gifts of the Spirit anymore. He's saying the gifts of the Spirit won't be necessary, necessary when you get to heaven because the purpose of the gifts are going to be fulfilled. Now, Paul then likens this fleshly encroachment into the practice of the gifts as childishness. He says these things need to be put away. These arguments over the gifts need to be put away and to move on to maturity. And he uses to the Corinthians a very culturally relevant illustration as Corinth was not just filled with gongs and cymbals. In any open or public meeting house, there would be brass reflective mirrors that you could go uh, check yourself out and take your selfie with. Uh, but they gave a hazy reflection of the viewer. Nobody could see clearly. And Paul says, that's kind of like right now. We don't know everything. We can't see everything clearly, but someday all things are going to be made clear. And then he drops the bombshell on him in verse 13, which is our theme for the year. He says, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of the three is what? Is love. Now, this is why this is our word for the year. This is why God gave us this word. And it's for this one particular reason, and others will discover throughout the year, but this above all else. Listen, love is the one area every Christian can improve in. Love is the one area every Christian can improve in. Nobody loves the way they should. We all lose our temper. You heard me say we all, right? We all lose our temper. We all act rude sometimes. We all do these things. We could all be better at this supernatural form of love. We could all be better at agape. And this is our target for 2022, to reduce the number of fleshly encroachments on loving each other and our enemies with a supernatural love. Now, listen, there are some areas where I have little to no patience. And thus, at times, I have little to no kindness. I have little patience and little kindness for lousy drivers. You know what a lousy driver is? Anybody who doesn't drive like me. A lousy driver is anybody who doesn't change lanes when I would have. A lousy driver is someone who drives a different speed than me. I have a passenger during my exceptional driving skills who reminds me of my attitude regularly while driving. And I'm just telling you, I'm going to work on this year. That this year. I'm going to work on being more kind. Even though I never say anything to anybody, I don't honk at anybody. There's plenty of trash talking going on inside the car. And I'm going to work on that. Listen, I don't always think the best, but Terry does. That drives me nuts. You know, I say, hey man, what did, why'd they do that? This, that, this, that. And her default reaction is maybe they're having a bad day. You know, you really don't know what's going on in their life. And, and you really ought to, to think about that. You know, it's like, oh, man. I'm going to work on that this year. I'm going to work on thinking the best as my default thought process. Now, you have your own list, and that's all I'm going to share of mine. But every Christian should be more loving. Every Christian should be more loving, especially to our enemies. Now listen, 2022 is the year of love for us for that reason. And it's likely a year where we're going to experience more hate than we ever have. We're going to have more evil spoken about us than we ever have before. And how are we to react to that? Agape. The supernatural love that isn't, doesn't fail when things get hard. And listen, our goal is the new commandment Jesus gave in John 13, 34 to 35. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you, agape, one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And listen, let me just say this, and don't get all puffed up, because I do. There's one thing that I've heard over the years more consistently about people who visit this church, 
And I've heard this over and over and over and over. Two things. You can sense the Holy Spirit, and those are loving people at that church. I've heard that time and time again. Let's increase our reputation in this city for being the disciples of Jesus. Let's do better at loving, and let's handle some of our short-temperedness, and be more patient and kind when we feel impatient, because we can all do better in these particular areas. And if all of us can improve in that area, then we'll have this as our common goal that everybody in Orange County knows that CCT is filled with the disciples of Jesus. That's our goal for this year. Amen? Amen. First of all, I want to say thank you, Jesus, for getting me through three services. I never, ever, 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 ever. I told Dave yesterday, you better record first service because that's all I got. And now here we are at the end of third and I'm going to walk behind that door. And if you hear a thud, that'll just be me hitting the ground. So um, anyway, I want to give honor to God first and foremost.